Good evening, everyone. Um, it is the top of the hour, so we'll get, go ahead and get started. So very warm welcome to everyone joining us today for this arthritis bowel hosted webinar on inflammatory bowel disease called Listen to Your Gut, a webinar on inflammatory bowel disease. My name is Shilpa Venkatachalam. I'm the Associate Director of Patient-Centered Research at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And just as a quick reminder, we have been conducting these webinars now for more than a year, and we will post a link in the chat box so you can access previously conducted webinars on other topics in autoimmune and systemic inflammatory conditions. We do these webinars as part of our research activities of the Global Healthy Living Foundation and also in partnership with the as -Is CRG, which stands for the Collaborative Research Group that concerns itself with autoimmune and systemic inflammatory syndrome. The as -Is CRG is part of PICORNET or the National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network. So we do invite patients from other patient networks who are also concerned with these conditions. Before I can uh, give, a, give an introduction to our very distinguished speaker for tonight, just allow me a few quick minutes to go through some housekeeping notes. So this webinar will be recorded and we will be sharing the recording with you on the Cricky Joints website so you can access it at any time. In the interest of time and for recording purposes, all members in the audience have been muted. We do encourage questions, so if you do have questions at any time during this webinar, please send them via the chat box that you see on your screen. We will have a question and answer session following this presentation, during which we will try to answer all your questions. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. With that, I'm I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our very distinguished speaker of tonight, Dr. Bharti Kochar. Dr. Kochar is an adult gastroenterologist who specializes in seeing patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Her research interests are in the management of IBD in older adults and those who are medically more complicated. She also works closely with Dr. Mike Kappelman, who is the principal investigator for the IBD Partners Patient Powered Research Network. Today, Dr. Kocher's presentation will focus on inflammatory bowel disease, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, or UC. We will discuss the current knowledge on IBD, including what it is, how it is diagnosed, who it affects, and we'll talk a little on the currently available therapeutic options and highlight current research around the understanding of immunosuppressive medications used for IBD treatment. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Kocher, um, and I'm going to transfer control to you, Dr. Kocher, at this time. Thank you very much for spending this time to talk to us today about this very important topic. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, Shilpa, and the Global Healthy Living um, Foundation, as well as uh, thank you all for joining. I look forward to uh, a productive time talking about inflammatory bowel diseases. So in this talk, we will address the following questions. Um, what is IBD? What causes IBD? Who gets IBD? And how to treat IBD? These are all questions that my patients often ask me when I see them in clinic, especially during that first visit after they're newly diagnosed. Um, at the very end, I will briefly discuss a pilot research project funded by the generosity of the As Is CRG um, that Shilpa mentioned to help advance the treatment of older adults with inflammatory bowel diseases. So inflammatory bowel disease um, consists of Crohn's disease um, and ulcerative colitis, which are both chronic remitting and relapsing inflammatory conditions of the GI tract. While the exact mechanisms for Crohn's and UC are not very well established, it is known to be a type of autoimmune disease where your own body's immune system is reacting to its own organs. Crohn's disease is an inflammation that affects any part of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus, while ulcerative colitis, or UC, affects only the colon in a continuous manner from the rectum up. Crohn's disease is a focal segmental disease of the GI tract, meaning that one part of the GI tract can be involved and the next part can be normal and the part after that can be inflamed again. <clears throat> 
the majority of patients have involvement of the colon in the last part of the small bowel called the terminal ileum. However, other parts of the GI tract, such as the stomach and the first and second parts of the GI tract called the duodenum and the jejunum, could be involved as well. And while patients with Crohn's disease have a variety of symptoms, common symptoms are abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, fevers, and symptoms around the anus, also known as perianal disease. Crohn's disease has three predominant types of presentations. It can be an inflammatory disease, which can cause symptoms like pain and diarrhea. And what you see here are pictures of a colonoscopy of someone with Crohn's disease. Um, and you see these deep ulcerations, as well as some parts of normal colon between these areas of deep ulcerations. Um, so just normal pink, um, healthy colon between all these very diseased areas. Crohn's can also be an obstructive disease where the colon or small bowel narrows on itself and that can cause symptoms like cramping and abdominal distension and even vomiting. This is a picture from uh, someone who has a narrowing in their bowel. And so instead of looking wide open, um, it actually looks very narrow there where the arrow is pointing to around the area of an ulceration here. Crohn's can also form connections, which are called fistula or fistulae in plural. The more common ones are perianal or from the bowel to an area outside just around the anus. So this is a graphic representation of the last part of the colon the rectum. And these black lines are connections from the bowel to an area right outside the anus, which is right um, where the rectum leads out. Other connections that um, patients with Crohn's can have are the bowel in itself, another graphic representation of a loop of bowel that's forming a connection with itself. Um, another common form of fistulae or between the bowel and the wall um, or skin, um, typically the abdomen, since that's where the bowels usually sit right below, so they're called enterocutaneous fistula. Fistula can also form uh, from the bowels of the vagina or the bowels of the bladder, and symptoms often depend on what sort of fistula it is and where it's forming a connection to. Perianal fistula, which um, tend to be the more common ones, often present with drainage around the anus, and patients are pretty sure it's not coming out from their rectum. Symptoms of ulcerative colitis, or UC, often include diarrhea, which um, is typically bloody, urgency or urgency to move your bowels, uh, weight loss, as well as fevers. And as I mentioned before, UC is a continuous inflammation of the GI tract from the rectum upwards. If the inflammation only involves the rectum, it's called proctitis. If the inflammation involves the rectum and the left side of the colon all the way up to this descending colon, um, it's called left-sided colitis. And if the inflammation passes the splenic flexure or this big turn as the colon passes the spleen, it's called extensive or pancolitis. These pictures are of inflammation from you see um, when it looks like in a colonoscopy. And so you see normal here, which is normal, healthy pink, and you see some blood vessels in the background. Um, the mild inflammation is where the mucosa or the lining of the colon is more swollen, a little bit more edematous, um, red, um, and you don't see the blood vessels that well. In moderate inflammation, you start seeing some shallow ulcers and the mucosa starts becoming more granular appearing. And in severe inflammation in the bottom right, you have more ulcerations and spontaneous bleeding. But in all of these pictures, what's characteristic is that the whole bowel is inflamed continuously. Inflammation in the bowel from inflammatory bowel diseases is thought to be due to inflammation all over your body. And so inflammatory bowel diseases are known to have extra intestinal manifestations or symptoms of the inflammation in places other than the bowel. The most common extraintestinal manifestations are joint pains or arthralgias um, that can sometimes progress to an arthritis. And while most of the inflammation in the joints parallel disease activity in that those with more active GI disease have more joint pains, 
joint inflammation involving the spine and associated bones, such as sacroiliitis and spondylitis, actually don't have to parallel disease activity and can occur in remission as well. There are two skin manifestations of inflammation that are particular to inflammatory bowel diseases. One is erythema nodosum, which presents as a red painful bump, usually below the knees, but it can be elsewhere. And the other is pyoderma gangrenosum, which can present as a burn-like rash, usually again on the leg, but it can be elsewhere as well. And these are very distinct rashes that, that tend to be hard to miss. Um, and typically patients with these rashes do seek medical attention. The systemic inflammation from IBD can affect the eyes as well. Um, forms of inflammation in your eye are called uveitis, iritis, gloritis, and episcleritis, depending on which form, which part of the eye is affected. Um, symptoms often are eye pain, feeling like there's sand in your eyes, and a sudden decrease in vision that's quite unusual. And these are diagnoses that need to be made by an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor. Um, and there are treatments or immunosuppressive medications that can be used locally in the eye for these treatments. But I always tell my IBD patients when they're seeing their eye doctor to let them know that they have Crohn's or UC so that their eye doctors know what to look for. Mouth ulcerations can be a manifestation of inflammation as well. Um, they're more common in Crohn's, but they can be seen in UC as well. And patients with Crohn's disease are prone to a particular kind of kidney stone called a calcium oxalate stone due to decreased absorption of oxalic acid in the inflamed small intestines. Primary sclerosing cholangitis, or PSC, is a condition of the small bile ducts in the liver that's often associated with ulcerative colitis, but it actually can be seen in Crohn's patients as well. And UC patients should be getting annual screening for this condition by checking their blood for one of um, the liver function tests. One of the things that I didn't list here but can be thought of as an extraintestinal manifestation is fatigue. Many IBD patients report fatigue and it may parallel disease activity um, in that those with more active GI symptoms may have more fatigue, but it could also be present in remission. Other factors such as sleep hygiene and iron deficiency should be evaluated before attributing the fatigue to just having the inflammation, but it certainly is an issue for many IBD patients that we see in the Gudassin Clinic often. One of the most common questions I get is, how is IBD different than IBS, which is what my primary care doctor or other doctor or friends told me that I have. So I thought I would present a quick summary of IBD versus IBS, which are two commonly confused conditions. So firstly, the name is different. IBD is an inflammatory bowel disease, and a disease is a disruption of a normal body function. Well, IBS is a syndrome, which is a constellation of symptoms. The diagnosis of IBD and IBS are different as well. Um, IBD, as we've discussed, often presents with bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramping, weight loss. These are some of the more common symptoms. Um, and IBS uh, presents with abdominal pain um, and cramping, as well as diarrhea and constipation. And the diagnosis of IBS is really made with these symptoms of abdominal pain associated with diarrhea and or constipation um, that last at least three days per month in the past 12 weeks um, prior to presenting uh, for care. And there's a, a few particular features, um, relief of the abdominal pain with defecation, um, changes in stool frequency, as well as changes in the stool form. And you need to have these symptoms at least three to six months before that diagnosis is made. IBD, as we are discussing, is an autoimmune or immune-related condition. Um, and IBS is not related to inflammation at all. IBD is much less common than IBS, with an estimate of 1.6 million Americans affected by IBD, while IBS affects somewhere between 15 to 30% of the U.S. population um, that could meet criteria for the disease. And so that comes out to about 52 million. 
Lab tests in IBD are usually abnormal. Patients with IBD usually have some form of an elevated inflammatory marker in their blood, as well as maybe a low blood count or high platelets. Um, and uh, while IBF patients usually have normal labs um, or labs that could be explained by other conditions that they have. And um, when you do an endoscopy or a colonoscopy on a patient with IBD, there's inflammation there that um, is in, uh, integral or important for the diagnosis. While in an IBS patient, the endoscopic evaluation is typically normal. Another question I often get when I see patients, especially those who are newly diagnosed with an inflammatory bowel disease is, well, what causes IBD? Research on what causes IBD has come a long way over the years. However, we still don't have a short answer to this question. Um, the short answer is really that it's a constellation of factors that result in IBD. Um, immune system disturbance is certainly a key feature um, because as I said earlier, IBD is a matter of an over-responsive immune system. Um, environmental triggers um, are certainly thought to contribute. One of the most popular hypotheses is the hygiene hypothesis, which is that limited exposure to microorganisms changes the balance of the immune system. And um, some people think this may certainly explain the evolution of IBD still. Um, other thoughts about environmental triggers uh, include the fact that this was initially a disease that was more prevalent in northern and western nations, and over time as nations are westernizing, there are more patients with IBD in these countries, um, which again speaks to some environmental triggers. The gut microbiome disturbance is another well-established um, etiologic factor for IBD. Um, it's now known that IBD is more often diagnosed after a GI infection, um, and there's some data that IBD seems to be more diagnosed after exposure to certain antibiotics. Um, and again, this suggests that there might be some disturbance in the normal gut flora that's implicated in disease. And while there are many studies on what is normal gut flora and which bacteria is not good, we actually don't know definitively if there are specific microbes that will definitively result in the diagnosis of IBD. A genetic predisposition has been described for a long time um, in the evolution of IBD. And there are actually certain ethnic groups like Ashkenazi Jews that are at higher risk for inflammatory bowel diseases. In studies done on twins, um, those having an identical twin with Crohn's disease confers a 30 to 40% risk uh, for Crohn's disease in the initially unaffected twin and a 10 to 15% risk for ulcerative colitis. Um, this, again, speaks to there being some sort of a genetic predisposition for IBD. And there are actually over 160 gene loci that are associated with IBD, and many are near genes that code for proteins that function in the immune response to bacteria. But despite extensive research, there have been no genes identified that always cause IBD. The epidemiology of IBD is important to understand as it does give us a sense for why this is a disease to care about. Um, a recent population-based study in Olmsted County, Minnesota found that the incidence or the number of new diagnoses of IBD is increasing over time. And we can assume that this is the case around the United States as well. The same study demonstrated that the prevalence or the number of people living with the disease is increasing over time as well. And so, as I mentioned before, there are about 1.6 million Americans with IBD currently. Another question that people often ask me is who gets IBD? And these are data, um, again, from the same Olmsted County cohort. And what they've shown here is that IBD, like other immune-related conditions, are traditionally diseases of the young, with the majority of diagnoses being in the 20s. However, as you can see from these graphs, um, there's a second peak of incidence or new diagnoses in the 50s for, Crohn's disease, for ulcerative colitis and in the 40s for Crohn's disease. So, Ulcerative colitis was first described by Sir Samuel Wilkes in London um, in 1859. 
And then in 1932, Dr. Burl Crone, an American gastroenterologist, published a paper on a case of what he then called regional enteritis in the Journal of the um, American Medical Association in 1932. And this has since then um, come to be called Crohn's disease as he first described it. And what you see here is the um, fact that inflammatory bowel diseases were traditionally described in Western and Northern populations, but over time, especially in the late 20th century, the number of cases of um, inflammatory bowel diseases is increasing in newly industrialized countries. And these maps show the same trend. The map for Crohn's disease is in the upper left-hand corner, and the map for UC is in the lower right-hand corner. While the highest prevalence or those living with the disease remains in the Western nations in the deep orange, um, such as United States, Canada, Australia, and Scandinavian countries, the prevalence is actually increasing in countries like India, which you see in the beige. So now that we've spent some time familiarizing ourselves with the disease, I thought we could learn about treating the disease. And before we discuss the actual medications themselves, it is important to know what the goals of treatment are. From a patient standpoint, the most important thing is to feel better. This is called symptomatic remission. We're also interested in endoscopic remission or having the inflammation that's seen on a scope like a colonoscopy resolved because we have some good data to suggest that endoscopic remission may correlate with better long-term outcomes for the patients. Histologic remission, or having no inflammatory cells on the biopsy specimens obtained from an endoscopy, is another goal of treatment. We also want to treat to prevent a recurrence of disease um, and symptoms, as well as to control inflammation, to control complications of IBD, which as we discussed before, it can be forming obstructions or connections in Crohn's disease or having worsening inflammation in ulcerative colitis. It may also be helpful to understand some big picture concepts when discussing IBD with your doctor. The first phase of treatment is called induction of remission or calming your body's inflammation down in a quick way. And there are some medications that are good at achieving this aim. Since IBD is a chronic disease without a cure at this time, I tell my patients that until a cure is found, they will most likely need to be on some form of therapy for IBD, also called maintenance of steroid-free remission. Once the remission has been induced, the remission has to be maintained even if you're feeling well. And this is a very hard thing to convince people of to continue taking medications when they're not feeling that well. And there are some medications that are very good at achieving this specific aim. And there are other medications that are good at achieving both induction and remission, and we'll talk about all of these. Mucosal healing is what I've discussed before. It's the same as endoscopic remission, having your GI tract look as close to normal as possible when we do an endoscopic evaluation. There are a number of studies that have looked at the best possible way of treating IBD, and some of these studies are looking at using one medication or monotherapy Combine, um, compared to combining medications or combination or combo therapy. Combination therapy may help increase the potency of one medication as well as use two different mechanisms to calm inflammation. Another concept is step up treatment, which is starting with the more benign treatments and then progressing to treatments that come with more risks if you don't initially respond to the benign treatments. And top-down treatment is another um, concept to understand, which is starting with the treatments that carry more risks, but may be more effective, and after some years, de-escalating treatments if the patients maintain remission. So this is the traditional pyramid of IBD medications that's often used to discuss the medical management of inflammatory bowel diseases. The bottom of the pyramid lists treatments with a lower risk profile, and as you go up the pyramids, the treatment carries more risk. I'll present each of these classes of medication to you in more detail. Aminosalicylates are a type of anti-inflammatory medication that's commonly used to treat mild inflammation in the colon or colitis. It's useful for both induction and maintenance of remission. There are very few serious side effects. I counsel patients that about 5% of patients who use a mesalamine formulation have a paradoxical reaction, which means instead of treating the diarrhea, it causes a profound diarrhea. If that happens, we can't use this medication to treat their colitis. 
It's also known to have a very rare kidney reaction. And so we check a creatinine or kidney function once a year. Um, but the vast majority of patients tolerate this medication quite well and have a very good response to it. Corticosteroids, or steroids as they're more commonly known, um, are very effective induction agents for moderate to severe disease. They're also good to use for short-term control of flares, although we like to minimize the number of steroid courses we use in a given year. Um, because we know from a number of studies that using corticosteroids as maintenance agents can result in bad outcomes, including a recent study that showed that those receiving long-term steroids with a diagnosis of IBD are at significantly increased risk for hip fractures, major cardiovascular events, and even death. But this should not deter the use of these medications as needed in the short term or a few weeks as needed. Immunomodulators are medications that alter the way the immune system responds. And these are very effective old medications as monotherapy in maintaining remission in moderate disease or in combination therapy for severe disease. They all have a long onset of action, which is what makes them bad medications for induction therapy. And there are a few serious side effects to be aware of. However, most of them are minimized by close monitoring of their blood work. These medications can cause liver dysfunction and bone marrow suppression. And so we check liver te function tests as well as blood counts every three months. And if there's any signs um, or early signs, we can change the doses or discontinue these medications and the body will recover. Um, with thiopurines, there's also a very small risk of lymphoma or blood cancer. The studies we currently have show that using a thiopurine for long term or over two years can double your risk of lymphoma. But the baseline risk of a lymphoma for everyone in the general population is very, very low, 2 in 10,000. So using a thiopurine makes that about 4 in 10,000, which is still a very low chance of getting lymphoma. The other class um, of an immunomodulator, methotrexate, is a medication I strongly avoid prescribing in young women because it can cause significant fetal malformations in the event of a pregnancy. Biologics are any medications that are created in a living system and most target molecules outside the cell. The introduction and widespread use of biologics to treat inflammatory bowel disease in the early 2000s has changed the course of the disease. For a long time, there's only been one class of biologics used to treat IBD, the anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF agents. Now there are new biologics being approved for the treatment of Crohn's and UC, it seems, almost every year. These medications are generally effective for both induction and maintenance of remission in those with moderate to severe disease. And the major complications are an increased risk of infections and lymphoma, which I will discuss in more detail soon. Currently, there are four um, biologics in the class of tumor necrosis factor agents approved for the treatment of Crohn's and UC. Um, in 2014, the FDA approved vetalizumab or Intivio for the um, treatment of both Crohn's and UC. And it's unique because it blocks inflammatory cells that migrate into the GI tract specifically, and therefore it confers less systemic immunosuppression. More recently, in 2016, the FDA approved ustekinumab or Stellara, which is a medication that's been used at lower doses to treat psoriasis since 2008 for the treatment of moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Small molecules are medications that often have targets inside a cell. The most recent addition to the UC treatment armamentarium is tofacitinib or Zeljans, a JAK inhibitor that has been used at a lower dose to treat rheumatoid arthritis since 2012. Tofacitinib is effective for both the induction and maintenance of remission in ulcerative colitis. The significant side effects that we counsel patients on are headaches, upper respiratory tract infections, and sometimes high cholesterol that can be pretty easily treated with a statin medication. There is a very slightly increased risk of herpes zoster infection compared to anti-TNF agents, so we also counsel and vaccinate for herpes zoster. So as you may have noticed in the past four years, there have been a lot of new medications to treat IBD. While some of them are older medications, we are using them at higher doses in the treatment of IBD, and therefore we don't have a lot of long-standing safety data on these newer medications. However, anti-TNF agents have been around for long enough for us to have a good understanding of the risks when it comes to the treatment of IBD.
a landmark study about the risk of serious infections as defined as an infection requiring a hospitalization with anti-TNF agents across all inflammatory disease states like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, as well as IBD, found that there's actually no significant difference in the risk of hospitalization for a serious infection when using an anti-TNF agent shown in this figure in the solid line and a thiopurine shown here in the dashed line. So while I do inform my patients that there may be a risk for a serious infection with anti-TNF agents, the big things we worry about tuberculosis or hepatitis B reactivation, we check for before starting treatment and treat them as needed. So the most commonly encountered infection actually with anti-TNF agents is an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, so they're more prone to essentially the common cold. Suppressing the immune system results in a risk for lymphoma. Um, a recently published, very large French study demonstrated that the risk for lymphoma is highest in those treated with combination therapy or those on both anti-TNF agents as well as thiopurines. But what's most important to notice here is that there's a risk for lymphoma even in those who are not on any treatment. So while the risk is low, it is serious enough that I discuss this with my patients before starting these medications, but assure them that the risks are low. And while there are risks of treatment, there are certainly risks of not treating disease. Another modality for treatment um, is surgery. In Crohn's disease, surgery is often done for those patients whose disease has progressed despite being on medications or to address a specific symptom um, or issue with the disease. However, in ulcerative colitis, surgery is often curative. Taking out the inflamed colon um, is removing the disease. The surgery to do this is often staged with the first stage being taking out the colon and another stage involving taking out the rectum and holding the small bowel onto itself to form what's called a pouch. About 30% of people who have a pouch may develop a complication of the pouch, including inflammation called pouchitis in the months to even years following pouch creation. So I don't promise my patients who have a colectomy for UC that they'll never need a gastroenterologist again, but it is certainly a good option for some UC patients, including those who have disease that doesn't respond to the current medical therapy. So after hearing all these scary things about the risks of treatment, some of my patients appropriately ask me, why treat IBD? I'll just deal with my belly pain and diarrhea. And so while, as I said before, there are risks to treatment, but there are risks to not treating disease as well. And this is a graph of a review of older studies in the days of not aggressively treating UC, which demonstrates that over time, there is an increased risk for colon cancer, um, especially about around 10 years, the risk uh, of colon cancer increases to somewhere in the 2.5% range. And therefore we aim to be aggressive with treating inflammation with the hopes that this will decrease the risk for cancer. In the remaining few minutes, I'd like to present to you some research I'm currently working on, which is generously funded through the Autoimmune and Systemic Inflammatory Syndromes Collaborative Research Group, um, which Sopa mentioned earlier. Um, as many of you know, the American population is rapidly aging, and the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the year 2060 will be more than double what it was in 2014. And so the number of older adults um, with inflammatory bowel diseases is also rapidly aging, and this is a graph um, showing in the purple over time, those over the age of 60 with Crohn's disease is increasing, and the same trend is seen in UC patients. And so not much is known about the treatment of IBD in older adults. Um, as I hope you've garnered by now, IBD treatment often involves weighing risks and benefits. Um, the studies of IBD medications are predominantly in younger people since the majority of the population with IBD is under the age of 40 and only about 10 to 15% of people are either newly diagnosed with IBD and now we're also seeing a new population that's aging with the disease. We do know from other disease processes like transplantation and cancer that as the body ages, it processes medications, especially those that alter the immune response differently. And conducting clinical trials in IBD patients um, who are older specifically is expensive and practically infeasible. The current clinical trials have about 3% or less 
of the patients um, that are about 60 years or older. And so we don't really have a sense for how these medications are processed in older adults. Um, so my research interests are certainly um, in expanding the knowledge base around what are medications do to older adults, how their bodies process these medications, and how we should be thinking about older adults with inflammatory bowel disease when it comes to their management. So as part of that, um, one study that I'm doing is comparing the response to infliximab or Remicade, which is an anti-TNF biologic agent, um, and comparing those who are older and younger on these medications through what's called a clinical data research network, or a CDRN. And so a graphic depiction of what a CDRN may be is a patient who visits the clinic has their data entered into their medical chart. And all of that data in the electronic health record can, or much of that data can go into this clinical data research network, which can then generate de-identified data about patients with certain disease conditions. And the results of processing these data will hopefully be used to better patient care again. So to detail my project um, involving IBD patients who are over the age of 18 who have received at least three doses of infliximab or Remicade and have a drug level to this medication measured. And I'm stratifying by the type of IBD they have, Crohn's or UC, and looking at patients by decade of life, so those in their 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera. And after accounting for weight and other pertinent medical conditions, medications, lab values that may indicate more severe disease, I will test to see those, um, to see who stays on infliximab um, long term, as defined by over 14 weeks or completing the induction and staying in the maintenance phase, um, and who goes on to have surgery as well as compared drug levels to see if there are differences between older adults and younger adults. Um, I look forward to keeping you all posted about the results of this um, study, as I do hope that it will be interesting. And with that, um, I'll end and uh, leave some time to uh, ask and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kochar. That was fantastic. Uh, some really useful information there that you provided. Um, and I guess the big takeaway, and this is something we hear over and over again, whether it's IBD or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, uh, I guess the big takeaway is that despite the risks that come with the medications, um, which is you know remains a legitimate concern for patients, it's it's really important to treat the disease because the risk of not treating it uh, are as bad or probably perhaps even worse. Um, and so, I, you know, that's something, that's a message that we hear a lot um, with, uh, within the different disease conditions that we work in. Um, we do have a few, quite a few questions, actually, so uh, I'll try to sort of get them all to you as, as uh, uh, um, efficiently as I can. So I'm going to start with a question uh, that came from someone in the audience who asked if a regular colonoscopy could detect which disease you may have. So I guess the question is, would a regular colonoscopy, uh, colonoscopy be able to tell you if you have UC or Crohn's? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, typically, patients present with symptoms first and then we do the colonoscopy looking for a disease. But actually, I'm seeing more and more um, patients who are coming in for a regular screening colonoscopy because they're over 50, um, and we go in and we find some mild inflammation that raises concern for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. And if that's the case, I certainly take biopsies. Um, and then, you know, I usually ask my patients before, do you have any GI symptoms? And most people are very adjusted to living with their symptoms. So they say no. And then, you know, when I talk to them after the procedure and say, well, I found some inflammation, you know, are you sure you're not having any GI symptoms? They say, well, now that you mention it, I've had diarrhea for the past five years. It's just been mild. So we are finding um, more new diagnoses of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis um, at an older age in those patients who are getting regular screening colonoscopies. Okay, and uh, there seems to be also a lot of confusion about how often to get, uh, how often, you know, the recommendations are for colonoscopies. Uh, could you provide a little bit of information on that? Is there a guideline recommendation uh, about that? That's a very good question as well. Um, so the first colonoscopy is usually the one where the diagnosis is made. Um, in my practice, um, I do like to check after we've initiated therapy um, to make sure that 
the medications are working. Usually we know by the patient's symptoms. So um, once the patient feels better and we've adjusted therapy to having the patient feel better, I'll say, let's go in and take a look and make sure the inside of your colon looks as well as you feel. So that's kind of the second colonoscopy. There isn't necessarily a time frame, but ideally we get the patient feeling better in about you know, six months or feeling better actually pretty soon after treatment, but we'll go in to take a look at least six months after initiating the treatment. Um, that's not necessarily guideline driven in that if the patient's actually feeling really well and you know, there's no other indication um, for a scope, we don't have to do that. Um, the real guidelines around colonoscopies are um, what's called surveillance colonoscopies or looking for early changes that may result in future cancers. Um, so the current guidelines recommend that after eight to 10 years of colitis or inflammation in your colon, so this is with Crohn's or UC, you get a colonoscopy one to two years, every one to two years, or you know, sort of depending on what changes are seen, um, with a very close evaluation of the lining of your colon to detect precancerous changes. Um, these guidelines are based on a lot of old data, and so there are new guidelines that are that we're trying to come up with to see if we can um, better alter these to the newer, more effective scopes that we're using and the newer treatments that we're using that are better at controlling inflammation. Um, but because of that graph that I showed you, where over at about 10 years of disease, you sort of have this increased risk for colon cancer around eight to 10 years after having colitis or inflammation in your colon, we like to keep a periodic eye um, with a colonoscopy to make sure that we're not missing any precancerous changes. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question uh, around medications for UC and Crohn's. Um, the question is if there are spe specific ones that work better for each of those. So you talked a little bit about the different medications available, but are there ones that are specifically re recommended for Crohn's versus ones that are recommended for UC? Absolutely. So the labeling um, for various classes of medications is disease specific. Um, while the amino salicylates or the mild anti-inflammatories um, that I presented as kind of that first class of treatment um, is best for colitis or inflammation in your colon. Um, there's one formulation that potentially could work for inflammation in the last part of your small bowel, but in general, we think it's not very good for small bowel disease. Um, within the biologics, um, Remicade, Humira, and Simsia are the three that are approved for Crohn's disease, while Remicade, Humira, and Symphony are the three that are approved for ulcerative colitis, and those are the brand names that I use. Um, Vetalizumab or Intivio is labeled for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but in our clinical experience, we're finding that it seems to be much more effective for disease in the colon or colitis, whether it's from Crohn's or UC, um, than disease in the small bowel. Um, but it is approved for both Crohn's and UC. And Eustachinumab or Stellara is approved only for Crohn's disease, while um, Topacitinib or Zaljans is approved so far only for ulcerative colitis. Great, thank you. And um, of course, you know, these are questions uh, we encourage patients to have with their clinicians and their GIs, um, uh, because we do know that there are uh, different medications might work for different patients very differently. So certainly, you know, these are these are great. This is great information so that patients can talk further um, and come to a shared decision making process with their clinician about what treatment uh, would be right for them. Um, we have another question on Crohn's, and this is about surgery in Crohn's. So the question is, if I do have surgery for Crohn's, what are the chances for a recurrence? That's an excellent question. Um, in the days when you had one surgery for Crohn's disease and didn't do anything after, um, which was the standard of care for a very long time, um, we recognize that there's about a 50% chance of another surgery within five years. Um, and so we've since had some trials that looked at using post-operative therapy for Crohn's disease, which is after you have a surgery, um, put you on a, an immunomodulating or immunosuppressing um, medication to prevent the recurrence of Crohn's disease. 
and um, that does significantly lower your chance of having another surgery. So um, these days we're very aggressive in our clinic about saying, you know, it's good that you're having surgery because you absolutely need it. We need you to come back to us though as soon as possible. We'll restart therapy as soon as it's safe um, as deemed by the surgeons. Um, and then we actually go in about six to 12 months after surgery to take a look at where they connected you back um, go in with the colonoscopy and um, and see if there's a recurrence of disease there. And if there is, then we'll be more aggressive with therapy. And if there isn't a recurrence of disease, then you continue on therapy. But the importance is to be on some sort of um, medication, medical therapy for Crohn's disease after a surgery um, to prevent a recurrence. Okay, great. Um, we have another question around fatigue. So this question, and I'll try and condense it. The question basically is that we hear a lot about fatigue in various autoimmune conditions. And the question is around why that's the case. Why is fatigue such a, such a big symptom in so many of the different autoimmune conditions? Is it because the immune system is working too hard? Is it because uh, the patient may be on immunosuppressants? Or is it really because um, uh, conditions cause anemia? Some of the chronic conditions can cause anemia, uh, specifically anemia chronic disease. That's an excellent question, and I wish I had an educated answer. Um, I think it's likely all of the above plus something else. Um, there's certainly a lot of research um, going on in this field because it's a very important question for patients. But um, we know that patients who are treated um, and are in remission still have fatigue. Um, patients who have poorly controlled disease that um, have fatigue that sometimes improves after we control their disease. I think anemia is certainly um, a significant contributor. But um, the other thing I look for is um, iron deficiency even without an anemia. Um, and I've had, and this is just anecdotal um, experience, but I've had some patients tell me that if I correct their iron deficiency agree, uh, aggressively, um, even if they're not anemic, they do feel an improvement in their fatigue. That hasn't been the case for all patients. There's a few small studies that um, you know, provide some evidence to doing this. But again, a lot of these are individualized, um, uh, individualized recommendations and individualized things to discuss between you and your doctor, or there might be something very specific to your condition. One of the other things that I've really started doing more recently is investigating sleep in my patients. Um, people with chronic diseases, uh, not surprisingly, don't sleep so well. And if you're not sleeping well, there's a, a good explanation for fatigue right there. Um, so just because you're sleeping for a long time doesn't actually mean that you're sleeping well. Um, and I have encouraged some of my patients to alter sleep hygiene, sleep habits, and sometimes even see a sleep doctor to see if something could be done to help them sleep better and see if that might address their fatigue. But the short answer is I don't really know um, what the deal with fatigue and inflammation is, but it's clearly prevalent and something that we do need to know more about. Great, thank you. Um, I think one question that keeps sort of popping up uh, and that, that's really important for patients is around uh, diet, food, uh, and IBD. And the, this question is specifically on uh, whether or not there is and what kind of evidence there is um, uh, between the connection on the connection between gluten diet and, and IBD. IBD. Oh, okay, that's um, a, a great question. It's something that comes up in clinic often. Um, so we know that gluten does not cause or is not associated with an IBD. Um, a gluten allergy, as I'm sure most of you know, is um, celiac disease. And um, more and more there's diagnoses of um, non-celiac gluten sensitivity or a sensitivity to gluten. Um, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to say much more about gluten and inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, we know that they're not sort of directly related, but um, they may be associated. The, the question on diet and IBD can the bigger picture is actually a very important and interesting one. Um, and it's something that patients are very interested in, but um, it does kind of, will take up a whole other hour. So um, hopefully we can talk about that in the future. Um, and we are looking into diet dietary therapies for IBD, and the pediatricians actually um, use a specific um, type of dietary therapy for induction of 
remission um, in Crohn's disease. And so um, I do believe that the diet is very important in inflammatory bowel diseases. Unfortunately, our research is not quite um, up to date on what we can advise patients on. Thank you. And yes, it's uh, it's sort of a very uh, important topic for patients. So hopefully we'll do we'll do a series of uh, webinars on diet and different autoimmune conditions. We can invite you back to do a, a special webinar on that topic itself. Um, we have a couple more questions here. One is, uh, and this is a really interesting question. When you say there's a genetic basis for IBD, is that different to saying that IBD is hereditary? Yes. Um, just because you, when you say something is hereditary, you sort of um, have this implication of what's called traditional Mendelian genetics in that um, you have, you know, one parent with IBD and then you have a 25% chance of getting it. Um, so IBD doesn't quite work that way. Um, there is a genetic basis and that, as I discussed, you know, their twins are at higher risk for getting IBD, um, as well as IBD tends to run in certain families. And there are identified genes that seem to be associated with those who have IBD, um, but it's not classically passed down. So what I usually tell my patients is because the IBD patient community is also getting to be stronger, um, you know, as you start meeting people and connecting um, with other people with the disease condition, there isn't a guarantee that just because two patients, two parents have IBD that your children will have IBD. Um, if you have one parent with IBD, the statistics are somewhere, you have about a 10 to somewhere between 15% chance maybe of, of developing an IBD. If you have two parents, that's more in the 30 some odd percent range. So again, it's not uh, a guarantee that you'll have a child with IBD just because two partners have IBD. And that's obviously rare. Thank you. And we have one question around, actually, these are two questions I'll ask you together. Um, IBD causes joint pain is what we hear often with patients. This, this patient asks us if it's a form of arthritis and also why does IBD cause joint pain? That's one question. Second question is why IBD, having IBD increases your chances or, of getting an eye disease such as uveitis. Those are both great questions. Um, so because inflammatory bowel diseases are um, thought to be due to systemic inflammation or inflammation everywhere else in the body, um, the same inflammation that's causing the GI symptoms like the diarrhea and the abdominal pain and the bleeding um, could be causing the joint pains and the eye problems. So it's, it's just about where the inflammation is going. Is, are those inflammatory proteins and molecules going into the eye or the skin or the joints? Um, and so that's, that's what's thought to be the primary reason between these various extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. Great, and um, uh, another question that comes from the audience is if IBD, having IBD increases your chance of um, getting another autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis? That's a very important question that we actually don't have much um, much evidence towards, but inflammation tends to beget inflammation is what the current data shows. So what that means is if you have one inflammatory condition, you are likely um, to have another inflammatory condition. And so that's why when my patients with IBD um, complain about their joints, then you know I do say, well, let's treat your disease, let's get things under control from a symptom standpoint, let's see how your joints are doing. But if the joint pain persists, I'll look for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and I do find that a lot of patients, you know, have psoriasis. Um, I've had patients sent in by their dermatologist or their rheumatologist because they have, they're being treated for one condition and they mention to their doctor that they have diarrhea. So they'll send them over and say, you know, should you probably do a colonoscopy to check for Crohn's or UC? So I do think that they tend to run um, concomitantly. Um, we don't have great studies to show, though, that, you know, you're certainly at like a significantly higher increased risk. Thank you, Dr. Kocher. We have two more questions. Thank you so much for answering these so very patiently. This one is about remission. Um, the question is, if you're in remission and you don't have any symptoms, does that mean you don't have the disease at that point in time? Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question. So unfortunately, inflammatory bowel diseases um, are uncurable at this point, incurable at this point. And so um, what that means is that once you have the disease, you always have the disease. Um, we like to get you in what's called a deep remission, as in you feel well, so symptomatic remission. Your colonoscopy looks good, so endoscopic remission. And the biopsies are normal, so histologic remission. Um, so this is what we call a deep remission. So it, it's effectively as if you don't have the disease. Um, but you do carry that diagnosis, um, and you should be on some sort of therapy to maintain that very deep remission. Great. And then our last question, uh, you mentioned uh, antibiotics, infections, and IBD. This question asks if uh, IBD, may, when you did mention, mention that, you said IBD may be diagnosed following, following an infection and then administration of antibiotics. The question is, does this mean that antibiotics can actually cause IBD or can it trigger the immune system to react in such a way that it leads to an autoimmune condition? So it's a very good question. I would never say that antibiotics cause IBD, um, but I would say that because IBD is so multifactorial, there might have been something brewing in the background. So you had the right genetic predisposition and the other environmental triggers. Um, and, uh, the, and the antibiotics were what caused a small gut microbiome disturbance that might have then just tipped the scales in the favor of developing IBD. Um, it's very difficult to do these studies where you take the same exact person with the same exact um, life circumstances and give one an infection and don't give the other an infection or give one an antibiotic and don't give the other an antibiotic and see what happens. So in the absence of those studies, we can never really say what actually caused the IBD. Um, certainly there is an association for some people who use, um, who have received an antibiotic or who've had an infection um, who seem to be diagnosed maybe um, with an IBD more than people of the same age and gender and disease um, and other disease types and things. But these studies are very difficult to do, so we have to interpret them very cautiously. Um, that's not to say that if you need an antibiotic for a serious infection, you absolutely should get it. It will not cause your IBD. It may be unmasking something that was brewing in the background. Great. Thank you. So I, I have my eye on the clock, and we are approaching the top of the hour. So I, I uh, want to wrap this up by saying thank you very much, Dr. Kocha. That was really interesting and useful information. Thank you for answering some of our questions very patiently. Uh, I could just as well see us asking you a, a few more questions and continuing this for the next hour, but we'll, we'll let you go at this point. And thank you to our audience today for all your wonderful questions and for joining us um, for this webinar. Please stay tuned. We will be posting up uh, the webinar, recorded version of this webinar, along with key takeaways on our webpage on Creaky Joints. And we will send you information about our next webinar for the next month. With that, thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you.